Good day, YouTube. I'm here again with my friend Joe. He leaves tomorrow to go back to his home. And there were some few questions from the last video that people had. Uh, two of them were, how do you know what job to pick in the military? So we'll talk about that. And there was a second question, which I went blank on. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll begin with that. How do you know what job? If somebody were to ask you, Joe, what job are you going to pick in the Air Force? What would you say? Well, most uh, <clears throat> most of the times, uh, a lot of the jobs that you have the opportunity of picking from really have to do with your uh, the result of your ASVAB scores, uh, and that's the test that everyone must take uh, prior to joining the military. And it basically breaks down, you know, uh, math, how well you are in math, general studies, things like that, uh, mechanical, uh, and then depending on the areas that you score high on, uh, will will determine what jobs you are eligible to apply for. Uh, like me, uh, I, you know, I, I barely uh, passed my ASVAB. I didn't uh, study for it. Um, I never thought that the military would be something for me. I, I think I took my ASVAB my junior year, um, and I scored very, very poorly. Uh, I'll be honest with you and tell you that my, my ASVAB score was probably the highest, was probably a 45, uh, to be honest with you. Now, lucky for me, uh, Security Forces is what I wanted to be. I wanted to come in as a cop. Um, it's something that I always want to do. And fortunately, at that time, I can't speak to it now, but at that time, uh, I think I be I met the cutoff. And uh, so I, I jumped into that particular position. Um, now, my career is somewhat a little bit different than most, whereas most people who join the military, they stay in, in typically in one uh, Air Force specialty, AFS. Uh, I didn't necessarily do that. Um, I actually, uh, as I was going through uh, my cop uh, career field, uh, I ended up getting injured. And I had, to, I had two options. I had to either uh, separate from the Air Force uh, or retrain. And so I chose to retrain. Um, again, because my scores were so low, I had to take the ASVAB test again to try to pick up my scores. And you can do that. Uh, whether it's be, um, before you even come in the Air Force. If you, if you take your first test and you don't do so well, your recruiter should tell you, hey, go ahead and study a little bit more, take the test again, and, and you can increase your scores, and, and then you can open yourself up for other jobs. So um, I ended up becoming a cook. I went from being a cop to being a cook. Now, I tell people all the time I, I joined the military to serve my country, but I didn't mean it literally. Uh, and as a cook, that's what, exactly what I did. Um, throughout my career, um, there was opportunities to retrain. Uh, as, as you hit your three-year mark, you'll have an opportunity to cross-train, uh, do something else. But again, there too, you have to be eligible, uh, not only academically uh, on your scores, but also um, on your, perf your enlisted performance reports, your EPRs, which are basically your annual appraisals. You have to be able to do a good job in whatever it was that you were doing. Um, so now I like to say that I had the best grilled cheese sandwich in three counties, and so that's why I got the opportunities to cross-train into other jobs. Um, and so I did, I cross-trained into uh, information management, which is a, a little more of a computer uh, personnel records types of, uh, of, of a career field. And so I did that for a while. And then again, I just got um, tired and bored and wanted something else, so I got an opportunity to cross-train again into a special duty assignment. And um, there's several special duty assignments in the Air Force, as in most uh, uh, career uh, military uh, branches and so I got the opportunity to, to jump into what's called professional military education to be an instructor uh, to teach at the Airman Leadership School which is a school where uh, after three years of service um, you get you have to go through this professional military education to uh, be eligible to, to be promoted to the rank of Staff Sergeant E5 um, but once you graduate from our course you are now eligible to become a supervisor of other uh, airmen so it was, a, it was a good opportunity. I did that for four years. Um, and even between that, there's opportunities for, uh, for individuals to do things on the side, i.e., um, I, um, I did a little, of, a little bit of a linguist. Uh, I spoke Spanish, and I, I took a test, and uh, it opened up some um, temporary duty assignments for myself. Uh, one was in Cuba as a linguist, and one was in Washington, D.C., uh, working for the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, there we were working with uh, FBI agents doing counter drug um, um, stuff, and uh, that was great. That was an awesome opportunity. Now the uh, the linguist was not my AFS, but 
it's something that I had the opportunity to go out and do. Same thing with working, uh, because I work with Counter Drug, I did some work with uh, our OSI Office of Special Investigations, where I was actually working as an undercover uh, agent, um, actually uh, trying to get um, people in the military, our airmen in particular, um, bust them uh, for selling illegal narcotics. Because, uh, um, you know, most people think, well, you join the military, you're, you're a straight shooter. Uh, you know, our population in the military is just like the population in the civilian world where we have people that are in our Air Force that do not belong in our Air Force. And so um, I, took, I took the opportunity to uh, make sure those people uh, no longer stay in the Air Force. So that was, that was a great opportunity. Uh, later on, I went um, back to my career field information management. I did that for a couple years, and then I had an opportunity to become a military training instructor uh, and uh, applied for that job. And so uh, I did that uh, for, the, for the four years before I, I separated and then uh, lastly as an inspector general back in my career field as an information manager. Um, so it, as you can see, um, you know, beginning in the Air Force, there's opportunities for you to uh, apply for something that you want to do. But don't be discouraged if you get into that career field and you say, you know, uh, maybe this is not what I wanted to do. Uh, I thought being a cop was something that, that uh, really I was excited about. It's kind of not where I want to be. And so it doesn't mean that you're stuck in that particular job for the rest of your Air Force career. You have multiple opportunities throughout your career uh, to, to cross-train, to apply for other special duty assignments like professional military education, like uh, military training instructor, like first sergeant, and, and things like that. So um, it just really depends on what your drive is going to be. Uh, but when you, once you're already in and you start applying for these special duty assignments, uh, I'll be honest with you, you have to be, uh, you can't be an average airman they're not gonna accept average airmen. They want people who are above and beyond. Uh, and kind of like we spoke in the last video, uh, it's, it's about your attitude and how much you're gonna be open to learning and, and your drives and your successes. Um, so uh, if you're just wanting to be an ordinary Joe, that's not gonna happen. Uh, and I think that's, that's fair to say for, for most jobs, it's not about being average, you have to be uh, above average. So um, when it comes to uh, those kinds of jobs or opportunities for you to do other things, um, you, you have to step up. Um, like I like to tell my trainees, um, e either uh, you step up or you step out. It's just one or the other. There's no way around that. So, Perfect. Now, I like the example that Joe shared with us, which is he talked about his ASVAB score first and how he didn't have the highest ASVAB scores. But if you know Joe, him and I met in 2000, back when we were both senior airmen, and one thing that we had in common, we have a lot of things in common. We're both Laker fans, right? No, absolutely. <laughs> San Antonio Spurs. Spurs, Lakers fan, is we have a lot in common, but one of them was education. And Joe is a perfect example of an individual who was dealt the hand in his career that he was given. But he has, and I say this not only as a friend, but because it's what I've seen in him, is he did the most that he could with his job. So he went to services, and when he says that he had the best grilled cheese sandwich in three counties, it's true. It's in his EPR because I've seen it. It's true. <laughs> That's an example of him maximizing, stepping up, like he said, even if it's something that he was crazy about or wasn't crazy about, but he maximized that opportunity. People are going to notice, in my opinion, how good you are or how not good you are. And we wear our name here in our uniform. Even when we're outside of the uniform, people know who we are. They're gonna say, this individual is sharper. He's not the person that we want for this special duty job. So I don't know if Joe retook the ASVAP score, but he was able to retrain, which leads to my next thing. Joe is very educated, and he has taught others, literally in the Air Force and at a college when you were stationed overseas, and in his post active duty military life, he is teaching people right now. He has taken advantage of those educational benefits which are there. That's another topic that we can talk about for a very long time, but he's also talked about doing things outside of your career field. When he said he was a linguist, when he went to Cuba, Washington, D.C., maybe it was three months, six months or so, but that is an example of so many opportunities out there where we can step out. I did equal opportunity for three years and I retrained from my first job, firefighter, which I thought was great, but it wasn't for me long term, so I went into personnel, I did a special duty job. 
Joe's done a few special duty jobs himself, and he's now retired. He's younger than me. I'd like to ask Joe, looking back at your career, is there anything that you would do different? Maybe the answer is yes, maybe the answer is no. Any, anything that you'd like to share with us? Well, it's easy to, to say that uh, looking at a 20-year career, and, and I, I thought I had a very, very great career. I enjoyed all my assignments. Sure, there was times where it was, it was tough, uh, it, was, it was hard. I'll be honest with you, being a military training instructor was the hardest job uh, I had ever done in my life. Uh, that, was, that was a pretty shocking thing uh, to try to adjust to when you show up to a base. Um, and you know your career has been always on the high end and then you show up to a base and you meet 500 other military training instructors who are better than you. It's a shock. It is, a, it is an absolute shock. It's very humbling. And that's one of the big things that military training instructors, we try to tell anybody who's going to go to that career field is just be humble. Uh, because uh, it doesn't mean you're not going to be at the top. It just means that it's going to take a while for that to happen. It just doesn't occur overnight. Um, so it was a great, great challenge uh, for me. But uh, would I change anything? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't change anything. Had I known then what I know today, um, I would have uh, pushed myself harder in high school to get better grades um, and, and to go on to college and, and try to become a commissioned officer. Um, I, I think if anything, that's the one thing I would change. Uh, that being said, uh, you know, those of you who are out there who are afraid, uh, well, I don't have the, the greatest grades and so I don't know what jobs I'll be able to pick. <clears throat> I'll be honest with you. My, my transcripts, and I use it when I've, speaking, I've spoken at uh, college commencements, um, I actually pull out my high school transcripts from, from my pocket and I, I read it and it's a 1.98 GPA. Um, I barely graduated high school. Um, and that's not th something I'm proud of, uh, it's just something I wish I had changed. <clears throat> that being said, it didn't stop me from uh, moving forward and trying to continue my education. And that's one of the great benefits and, and um, we talk about, and Hugo and I have been talking about it throughout our careers, how the Air Force has given both of us, I know, the opportunity uh, to, to not only um, change that, that track that we were on, or even our families at, at that point. I was the first in my family to graduate high school. Uh, let alone college. Same thing with Hugo. He graduated, he's first in his family to graduate college. Um, and then we just move on from that. We continue the drive. And so <clears throat> I can honestly say that after a 20 year career, um, the blessings that the Air Force has given me, the opportunities, and oh, by the way, uh, the push from your family, your friends, your loved ones, um, helped me get to the place where as I retire for 20 years of military service, I retire with five college degrees. Um, and, and I can't speak enough about it. And the best part of that is no college loans. It was all paid for. Uh, and so that, that is great. And so post-retirement, now as a, a junior ROTC instructor, <clears throat> I get to, again, continue pushing that education that we speak of, uh, educating tomorrow's leaders today. Uh, so um, no, would I change anything? No. Uh, had I known the things that I know now, would I do things different? Yes. Um, but overall, it goes back to uh, what we spoke to at the last video is your attitude. It's your drive, it's your commitment, uh, not only to yourself, to your family, but, but to the Air Force as well. True, true. So our backgrounds are another similarity that we have where for me, I'll speak for myself, I joined the Air Force because I needed some guidance, some discipline, some vision. And I see a lot of that in Joe as well. Another thing that we have in common is I'd like to say that we're both opportunists in the sense that we take advantage of opportunities. Uh, Joe talked about having that support system just a few moments ago, whether it's family or friends, mentor, um, because find a mentor. That's very important. I had a lunch with my son today who's grown, and I said, I see that you have some mentors in your life. It's priceless. We don't have to invent something, especially if it's already been invented, but we can see what we want to use and what we don't want to use from others, positive examples and negative examples and what they're doing and maybe their leadership and use that to our advantage. Joe, what would you say, if you have somebody who's watching this video, let's just say we have a combination of people who are in high school, who are thinking about joining the Air Force, or we have somebody that's already in the Air Force, what advice would you give to that individual that we haven't already talked about? Uh, really, uh, the biggest thing I would tell my students as, as high school students, because I teach high school students nine through 12, um, or even uh, the junior airmen that are in the Air Force is 
just keep an open mind. Um, and I know that's hard. It's a hard concept to try to grasp, especially when we're younger, um, because we're, we, we, we honestly just don't like hearing anybody tell us uh, that's older than us uh, that this is what we should do and this is why. We, we want to figure that out for ourselves. Now, uh, just like Hugo said, um, why reinvent the wheel? Um, if it's already been done, just listen to those people who are telling you that, just like your parents did. Uh, as we grew up, our parents told us, you know, don't stick your finger in a light socket. Uh, don't stick your finger in a light socket. We didn't want to hear it, and what did we do? We stuck our finger in a light socket, and then we learned very, very quickly why they told us what they told us. It's no different in the Air Force early in your career or even in high school. Uh, if your instructors are telling you things, uh, make sure that, uh, that you listen to them. With One of the big things I tell my my uh, my cadets in high school. I teach them, you know, the, the first thing that which is most important, the foundation, I believe, is customs and courtesies. Uh, if you address an adult, a teacher, you call them sir or ma'am. Uh, not miss, not John, not Paul. Um, and because that's where it all starts. And I think uh, we have a tendency as, um, as young adults, uh, young men and women coming into high school or even into the Air Force, that they just don't see it that way. And I think you're going you're gonna to learn as you go through life um, that uh, the customs and courtesies are a huge, huge foundation uh, of who we are. And a lot of people, um, I have, I've had uh, uh, students tell me, you know, hey, uh, sir, Miss um, Johnson uh, said thank you today. And I said, why did she say thanks? She said, because I called her ma'am. And, um, and that, th there's a positive negative side of that. And I explained that to my cadets. I says, you know, the, the positive side is that she appreciated the fact that you uh, call her ma'am and, and you're very respectful to her. The negative side of that is that she thinks that's that's out of the norm and, and, and actually that should be the norm and that's the sad part is that everybody doesn't call her ma'am or, or treat her with respect and so um, it's the same thing in the active duty Air Force. Uh, if you're a senior airman and you work with a staff sergeant you call him by his first name that's a huge problem uh, uh, unless that staff sergeant corrects it. Uh, there's, there's a rank structure and there has to be a rank structure. I think one of the questions we had spoke to, or somebody had mentioned was um, uh, professionalism and how, how, they, how they dealt with that. So and we'll, we'll tie into that here in, in a little bit. So um, customs and courtesies are huge and, and I think uh, it's a big, big part of uh, kind of lets everybody know who you are right from Joe. So. True, true, true. Now, the second question which Joe brought up is relationships between officers and enlisted. I'll have Joe start with that.